My guest on this week's episode of Susan Search is Kyle Roof, lead SEO at High Voltage, inventor of Page Optimizer Pro, and co-founder and SEO instructor at Internet Marketing Gold. Kyle is a veteran digital marketer and frequent conference presenter. A few places you might have heard him speak include InOrbit, SEOCon, and the Shang Mai SEO Conference. Kyle has a great perspective on SEO. He doesn't take much stock in what SEO celebrities mention in their conference presentations. He's a tester, and over the years, he's been able to bring a level of scientific rigor to the SEO process that is pretty rare. I'm going to start our conversation talking to Kyle about his approach to SEO testing and how it's evolved from the early days. I caught up with him at an interesting time. A few days before we went on air, there was a leak of the Yandex code base. It was fascinating to talk to Kyle about the implications of this leak and how he's approaching it. Grab something cold to drink and join me for a conversation with Kyle Roof. We'll chat about ChatGPT. We'll discuss Page Optimizer, his cool on-page SEO tool, and we'll spend a little bit of time talking about EAT. All right, Kyle, welcome to Susan Search. How are you doing? I'm doing great. <laughs> How are you? How are you? It is good to talk to you. I'm glad our mug got there in time. This is uh, yeah, this was uh, fantastic. This show's running like a Swiss watch. I like it. So um, <laughs> talking to you, I thought this was really interesting timing because the big story in SEO this week has been the supposed leak of the Yandex code base. So mm -hmm. SEO is all over the world, including, I guess, including and especially in places where no one even uses Yandex wanted to know how their ranking algorithm worked. Uh, it's important to point out, like the code base is more than just the their ranking algorithm. Uh, Mike King did a really good breakdown of everything that's in there. But, you know, one of the things I, th I thought was interesting, you've spent many years studying Google's algorithm and developed a re reputation as someone who really understood it. So. On your personal site, there's an interesting story of how you got a website to rank with like gibberish and a few keywords because you, you just really understood uh, this algorithm. That may, it may have been a few years ago, but kind of tell our audience who, who, who maybe aren't familiar with you about your background and, and how you've developed that reputation as somebody who really understands the algorithm. Yeah, I think um, so when I started in SEO, the thing that I, I, I was in a situation where I had to learn SEO. <laughs> like, I had to like get it done like right then and, and there. And I was really under the gun. And um, I started searching like, you know, is this a ranking factor or should I do this type of thing? Mm -hmm. And you get a lot of terrible answers when you do that. Yeah. Like you get like, you know, three yeses, three noes and three maybes basically. Right. And it occurred to me, I was like, oh, you know, people aren't really talking about this stuff because they're just running their own test sites. They're running their own stuff that they're doing. And that's what they are then learning, you know. And so then I started running uh, my own sites to just kind of figure out some things. And and in doing that, I realized, well, you can't just like have a site and try it. And I, I kind of found a few different ways where you could create pages um, uh, that target specific. They all target, say, the same keyword. And then you could change one thing on one page uh -huh. and watch how that page performs. And you can see if that is then a positive factor or, or a negative factor, no factor. And then a big movement forward for me in terms of, of this thought process was if you test in the inverse. So let's say you do something where you add one thing to one page and it goes up. Then if you subtract that from one page when all the other pages in your test have it and it drops, then you know you've got something. So you can, it was a way to really kind of fast track testing and fast track knowledge where I could say like, okay, so here's some baseline things. There's this, 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 and this that I know move the needle. And so we really need to key in mm -hmm on those types of things. And that's, so that's how, how I got really kind of going in, in terms of, of what I do and, and what I was learning in SEO. Uh, I spoke at a conference in 2015 about testing and, and mm -hmm. this was my first time speaking uh, publicly. And I really thought this is a really high level conference. And I really thought we'd be kind of sharing ideas. I'm doing it this way. How are you guys doing it? And then I realized that nobody's doing this. Like very few, very few people are doing this type of process. And that's when I realized that I was, I was onto something you know, where I could, differentiate myself from the crowd in terms of like, you know, I don't do SEO. I'm not testing on your site. I've tested on these sites and what I'm bringing to you are the things I know move the needle. And then I was able to expand and, and help grow my agency with my business partner and get our SaaS tool and get like my courses and stuff like that. And, that, and all that kind of came from that initial concept. Well, it's, it's interesting. I love this, the emphasis on testing and it's all over and things you present, things you write when I was doing the research uh, over and over again, that came up in, in, so, you know, you're not, you're not one of these people who just uh, on the face of it believes in best practices or uh, what Google puts into their, into their blogs. You, you want to have a level of scientific rigor to your process to understand it. Um, 
I get you. You change one thing, you add one thing, you get it. Uh, what I think of testing is much easier to think of it in terms of S- of PPC, right? You've got oh, AP yeah. testing, stuff like that. With SEO, it's less common. So I, I, at the risk of repeating yourself, I, I'm curious, how do you, how have you evolved your testing models uh, today versus 2015? And how are you performing tests? And maybe even what are some of the pitfalls you see from other SEO testers? Initially, one of the fun things to do was to create, uh, to optimize for keywords, words that didn't exist, just gibberish okay. keywords. And you could do that. And if you did that, you'd own the entire SERP. Mm-hmm. So if you were optimizing for those pages, you were the only ones there. And then that really decreased a lot of variables. It's a little bit more tricky to do that today um, in terms of like getting those those terms to rank or getting the pages to index can be, can be difficult. But you can do it a lot with... Um, like you can use English words that are strung together and say three word phrases that um, look like they should be terms, but they're not, you know, they just like you know, uh, an English speaking person wouldn't put those terms together. Mm-hmm. And when you do that and you search for those terms, the the stuff that comes up is, is worthless. Nobody's optimizing for those um, particular terms. So you can create pages that go after these um, nonsensical phrases, but they are actually English. They do index a lot better. Mm-hmm. So you can still run, um, um, very similar tests, but it is uh, much more tricky to do than it was before. Mm-hmm. We could just put up five gibberish pages, you know, with going after nonsense keywords and then really tinker with the algorithm quite a bit. That is a little more tricky to do than it was before, but you can still get there. The other thing you can do too, though, um, a, a good exercise is, is a field observation. The kind of idea of if you see something, say something. Yeah. And you know, when you see something on a site that's it's your own site, or you see this on a competitor site, starting to like methodically go through and see like, are other sites doing this thing? You know, and especially the, one of the things I always talk about is, is that the secret is hiding in plain sight. Yeah. Google doesn't hide the ball. Like when you search for a term, the sites that come up, those are the sites that it likes. You know? yeah. It's not like, and I'm going to throw in a trick one in there for no apparent reason. That, that's not how the, how it actually works. So if you start to see a pattern on something, you can start to uh, document that pattern. And you say like, okay, 15 of the top 20 sites are all doing this type of thing. So while you might not be able to do it in a real, in a, in a more controlled environment, you can, but that's, that's harder to set up. You can still get a lot of knowledge just simply by looking at the SERPs. And I think I'm also surprised by the number of SEOs that don't look at the SERPs. Mm-hmm. They look at a tool, all right. you know, they look at Ahrefs, they look at SEM rush, they look at Moz, they look at whatever, and they get their data from that and they start to, to do their SEO, but they actually haven't taken the time to look at what is actually there and why, um, yeah. why the results are the, are what they are. You know, you get a number from a tool, but you should look at what the SERPs are to understand what then you should do with that knowledge. And a lot of people don't actually do that. Yeah. It's like a mind shift that needs to, to happen. It's like, you, because you, you understand it. There's this unlock. I, I love this idea of the, the answers are hiding in plain sight. Psychologically, you're probably looking at SEO in a totally different way than, you know, 90% of SEOs out there. You know, I, I wonder how, how do you think that, that mind <laughs> I hope so. That <laughs> that, that's like, hope yeah. It, 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 what are some of the, some of the advantages in terms of just, you're going to be a better practitioner of the, of the, topic and you're going to stay ahead of the curve. I mean, I can think of a number off the top of my head, but in what ways has that psycho- psychology helped you? You're a veteran now. You've done this for many years. So how has it helped you in your career? I think the biggest thing is is being able to take some data and then make a prediction. Um, mm-hmm. I think where I became an expert in SEO is when I could predict what would happen and and hit that with some reasonable amount of accuracy. It's, it's very important to understand that you're not going to be right 100% of the time. There is a lot going on. You don't control the other websites. You know, you don't control what somebody else is doing. You don't control what Google is doing. And so you have to do stuff that will give you the best chance of success, where that if you repeat this process, you know that this gives you the best chance for success over the long run. And one, to get to that point, though, you need to be able to say like, okay, we're going to launch this page and we're going to make a prediction about when is it going to hit its first impression. You know, how many keywords is it going to be ranking for in month one, month two? We have a target keyword. Are we are we going to get in the ballpark for this term? Or is this just going to be more like we've got this term and we're only going to get to page four? You start to make those predictions. And then that's when you can really become an expert in SEO. Because yeah. most people just launch a page and then they hope and they cross their fingers and then they, they look at the results at the end. But they didn't really try to predict what would happen. 
Mm. And once you in once you get into the game of predicting like why, you know, what will happen, then you have to make justifications for why you're doing certain things. Right. I'm doing this because I think the outcome will be that. Mm. I'm doing this part because I think the outcome should be that. And then once you start to match up those things, that's when you can become a much better SEO. And uh, I think you'll get a lot of, even if you're not running specific tests, just by saying we're doing this for this reason and then seeing if it, if it happens, you're going to become a significantly better SEO. I love this. Uh, I, th- I think that's really, really well said. And that sort of forecasting, you you do think differently. There's no question. So I'm, I have a question in my head, but I'm having a hard time asking it in a way that it's not too open-ended. So let me give right. this a shot. Um, you know, Google's got, you've done all these, these tests, all this test next testing now. Uh, you, you know a lot about Google and the algorithm or algorithms that are, are working on every query. We're trying to rank better in SERPs. Based on, on your years of study, what have you found that Google really cares about? And maybe what are some of the biggest myths that, that SEOs get wrong um, that they think really Google cares about? But based on your study and based on the scientific rigor of, of what you've done, you've found to be, you know, that's, that's minor or insignificant signal. So when Google comes to a page, it the first thing it has to do, or in, what it tries to do, and this is called centerpiece annotation, um, they want to figure out what this page is about. Mm-hmm. That's that's step one. And then step two is, should we um, put this page into the index? Right. You know, all right, so we understand what it's about. Should we put it in the index? And then, and then rank comes after that. You know, how high should this thing go? And what I find amazing to me is when people want to rank for a particular term, and then they decide to get really clever and not use the term, uh. you know, like, <laughs> they're like, you know, like, you know, people talk about like, should your, you know, your, your title tag and your H1, should they be the same thing? And people are like, no, you want to like switch it up. So Google feels it's got, Google's trying to understand what this page is about. Right, right. Why are you making this difficult for, for a machine? Why are you trying to make this different? Though they should be exactly the same and they should contain your target keyword. And you should have your target keyword in the URL and you should have your target keyword in, in, in paragraph tags. And I don't know how many people like will say something like, well, you know, I'm using this theme and they put them in div tags. That's good enough. Is it? Are you sure? Because that's really hard for a search engine to figure out what that is. Make it super easy. So if you were to put your keyword in, in those top four places, and by the way, those have been the top four places since I've been testing in your that's URL right. title tag, H1 and, and paragraph tags, put your keyword in those four places and, and you've done 50, 60% of SEO. That's the secret. Like you've done a huge amount of SEO. Now there's a lot of minutia covering the rest of it where you can really get into it, but the, you can't miss that basic component of putting your keyword in the most basic places so that Google can understand what the page is about and then decide if it likes it. Very interesting. Very interesting. Well, I, I, the second part of that question, I think got me thinking about something I read this week. So, um, you know, Lily Ray posted a, something on Twitter that said basically like, where did this statistic come from? And it was a statistic that said that Yandex is 70% the same as Google. The point of her post is basically that that statistic seems to have been pulled out of thin air, that it was there. There's no way of knowing that and that it had never been reported by anybody who was like involved in Yandex or Google. I wonder if you've had experiences, you've had that experience a time or two, I guess. Uh, Is there anything you hear from SEOs, even good SEOs that repeat, that you've tested and found to be demonstrably false. Uh, do you have any myths that you you'd like to bust? Demonstrably false. Give me a second on that. Can I uh, let me address the first one? Yep. I saw that. I got. I saw that stat, and um, I, I also don't know. And I, I personally hadn't heard that before. Right. But um, the thing that instantly occurred to me about Yandex when the, when this leak happens yeah. is that um, Yandex has to be a few years behind Google, just right. generally speaking, right? But on the other hand, I'm confident that Yandex has stolen a few Google engineers. Uh-huh. Like they right. didn't just like randomly create their own. Thing, right? <laughs> they went out and bought some engineers that worked at Google. What information are they bringing? But but the information that they know on something that works and the reason it works and, and the, it's a very critical concept is that the only people that complain about Google results are SEOs. Yep. The people that use Google like it a lot. You know, they know that if they, they put a search term in, they have a really good chance of getting the information they're looking for. And that's why it's successful. Mm-hmm. So if you steal uh, some engineers from Google, which, again, I, I don't know if that has happened, but it seems impossible for me to not have happened. The people that are then writing the index code have a pretty good feel for what Google is actually doing. Right. So 
I would bet what we're going to see, and I have not spent a lot of time uh, on this thing, but the what you see in there is probably a really solid baseline for what is Google's algorithm. And then there are other things Google has done to go beyond that. But those things that they would do are only they're only going to do them if they're cost effective. Right. You know, they might have the capability of doing amazing things, but they're only going to implement if it's cost effective to them. Because if they're continuing to get ad revenue, and if they're continuing to get uh, people doing search and they continue with their 104% of the market share, they're not going to change anything. They only change things when those things, you know, are a, th are, are a threat, you know, that they're going to lose uh, advertisement monies, but otherwise they're going to keep it as is. So what I think that Yandex is going to show us is a really good baseline for where Google wants to be and where search engines want to be and, and um, what you probably need to do to kind of a, as a base level plus is knock those things out of the park. And then you're probably going to do pretty well in just about any search engine. Yeah, I like it. And I, I can't think of anything similar to this in, in my time being in this industry. Like it's, it's a very, uh, very interesting breakthrough and a lot to digest. I think I'll be talking to people about it a lot in the next, next few months. So another, um, yeah, to shift gears here, another big topic right now is that there's been an update to the quality raters guidelines. So now we're, we're talking for years, I've been talking about EAT. Uh, maybe for the last two or three years, we've had guests on. That is no longer the operative acronym. We are now living in a an EEAT world. Why the extra E and what, what do you make of this change? I believe the proper pronunciation is EAT. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to I'm trying to pitch that on, yeah. on, on podcasts and YouTube shows that it catches on. And then you're going to have a whole bunch of people on stage going EAT. Yes, I, I think. We'll I see think if it catches on. You, you may catch, get your wish here. <laughs> the actual one is um, experience uh, is the new one. So expertise, uh, authoritativeness, and trustworthiness were the three standards, and they've added experience. And what's interesting about that, in adding experience, they've also moved trust into the centerpiece of it, saying that, you know, we talked about <laughs> exper uh, 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 expertise and authoritativeness, but meh, it comes down to trust is really kind of the, the main thing. And then they added on this experience. Um also, when you look at it, they even address it in the new one. The new thing came out in December, right? They actually talk about a lot of people are confused <laughs> about the difference between experience and expertise, and there is a lot of overlap. And then the example they give is clear as mud when they, um, something along the lines of um, uh, uh, experience is how long somebody has done something and expertise is if they can calculate math or something like that. It, it really... It doesn't make a lot of sense. I wouldn't get lost in the weeds on it, to be honest with you. Um, I would worry about uh, the the quality guidelines state in two places quite clearly. Um, it is imperative for Google to know uh, who is responsible for the content. Okay. Who's, who's the company behind it and who wrote it. Mm. They, they say that twice as like, that's mission critical on all of this is basically at the end of the day, <clears throat> who is responsible for this? You know, if something were to go wrong, uh, who can, where can people get redress? You know, uh, if somebody followed your advice and your advice turned out to be terrible and it harmed them, you know, who can they then go after? You know, who can they seek redress from? Mm -hmm. If the product was, was broken or it didn't work as expected or never arrived, how can they do that? Or how can they get their money back or get anything back? And then as you get into more sensitive topics, the, the YMYL, your money or your life, Type situations, then that it could be even worse because people might not have just gotten a defective product, but they might have followed financial advice that is harmful. So in, in those situations, it, Google, I think, wants to make it very clear. It's like, who is responsible for this? Who is, who is the company behind this website and who is the author behind this information? And that's when I think the most, that's where most of the important things come from and, and, and the things you're going to want to do for EAT, I would focus on those things. Are you making it clear who owns the site? Are you making it clear uh, who, uh, wrote the content and, and that they can all be contacted, you know, they, yeah. they can, you can reach out and actually get a hold of these people. Yeah. It's, I, I love that. It's as clear as mud, uh, the, the distinction on some of these things, but it's, uh, even, even experience and trustworthiness are, are somewhat, there's like a Venn diagram with an overlap there too, I think. But I, I wonder if I, if I think about those four concepts and I want to understand them better. I'm not sure if weighted is the right word. Are they are they weighted equally in the the Raiders guideline? Are they, are each of them equally important, or is there one that you you focus more on? How do you how do you well, they, they, differentiate? They've even said trust trust is the most important thing. Got it. It doesn't matter how experienced somebody is if they're not trustworthy. 
Mm. So somebody could have 30 years in the industry and they're telling nonsense about something you know, because it's, you know, good for them. You know, maybe they get fame, power, uh, money, you know, notoriety, but it doesn't matter that their, their experience doesn't matter. It's their trustworthiness at that point. Are they, are they saying something that's, that can be trusted? Um, so that is clearly the the most important thing. And then, then after that, it, according to them anyway, it appears that the rest are somewhat equal uh, in, in, in terms of their evaluation, but trust is the number thing. And what I would equate trust to is who owns this website, <laughs> you know, is that, you know, who can we acknowledge it? And then who is writing this? And it doesn't necessarily have to be like a PhD or, or a medical doctor writing your stuff. It's really identifying that somebody exists. You know, that's, that's the biggest thing. Cause I honestly don't think how far outside your site is Google going to go. All right. You know, there, there's no way they're going to look at your author, click, click on their LinkedIn profile, go to their LinkedIn page. Like, Oh, this looks pretty legitimate. Right. Like let's read some of their articles that they wrote. Or, you know, let's go. Right. I mean, that's not happening. So it's really what you can demonstrate on your site is the key that this is a human that wrote this. And that also that we are a website or we're a company, we're a business and we're responsible for it. And those are things you have to make as clear as possible, I think on your own site. And I wouldn't rely on anything of Google going anywhere else to, to verify any of that information. All right. Well, awesome. Well, I was, uh, I was playing around on a seven day trial with a tool this morning called page optimizer pro. I think, you know, a lot about this. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, 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 I um, really appreciated the methodology. That was, that was kind of the phil philosophy that we started with. Even as it relates to this tool, I really like it because there are, let's, let's be honest, there are a lot of tools out there for SEOs. You know, what you created one though that has, that is modeled after several hundred experiments. So these are things that you've done as an SEO practitioner, as a thought leader in the industry and everything like that. You know, when, when you were coming up with, with Page Optimizer Pro, you know, there were all these tools out there. Uh, you could have looked at other tools that existed on the market, but you probably, you saw a gap and I, I'm, I'm curious, what gap did you see that you wanted to fill when you were coming up with it? Uh, we were using another tool. So this came out of the agency. So uh, our SEO agency, okay. and, and we were, we, we were using another tool and this tool had this really great um, optimization stat. And um, we realized we can use that uh, to gauge where we were with the SERPs and you know, basically how optimized are we compared to our competitors? And then we can decide what, which competitors have done it the best and we can really match ourselves against those. And we had a lot of success in, in doing this. And then the tool decided to change and they took that feature away. And I was like, well, man, <laughs> <You know? laughs> like we were doing really well with that. And I actually pinged yeah. their support and I got to some head of their support and they're like, Oh, we really don't like that feature for whatever reason. And I was like, well, okay, can I roll back the software? Can I just, you know, go to a, a previous version? Like, no, you, you can't. And, and they're like, cause it's really not worthless or it's just really worthless is what they said. And I was like, that's fine. Can I buy it from you guys? Or can mm -hmm. I, you know, can I, and they're like, no, you can't. I was like, okay. Yeah. So then I realized maybe I need to make my own thing. And so that was the, the biggest push. Initially though, we did it all by hand. We yeah. had spreadsheets and we were identifying important terms and then like certain locations and then literally counting by hand. And in doing that, it was, it was myself and, and um, my business partner, Maria. Uh, we were doing this together and we were able to, in doing that, kind of hand calculate and then hand work the math. All right. So if we w look at this range, how successful are we? And, and this was just repeated over and over and over again. And then we found a formula that really had a lot of success. It really kind of came through. And then we decided to write a script for it. We're using Google scripts. And then we were breaking Google sheets constantly. And Maria goes, um, she's like, I think this should be Python. And she goes, I think I can learn Python. And so she went out and she learned Python in about two weeks and in week three she wrote the initial script for the tool no way <laughs> yeah and it worked it was amazing and then what we ended up having to bring in what i did is actually showed this to some seos and i was like would you like this do you think this will work and they're like we love it so then um we gave it away for free on the back end of our site for six or seven months and then um we brought in an actual python developer to to make it a, an actual SaaS kind of robust code getting that away from maria's original code and then doing it from there and, and it's just kind of taken off since I would say it's not for everybody. Like you do have to have a little bit of SEO knowledge for sure, or at least some SEO comprehension of, of like, what are these terms that we're talking about or, or why we're going to approach it. But, um, after that though, I, yeah, I think you can be pretty successful with it. 
I love it. And I, I mean, I think one of the key parts of the tool is that you've got the competitors in there too. So I thought about this application. You, you correct me if I'm wrong, but there will be these these conversations I have sometimes that uh, someone will say, hey, in order for content to rank, it's got to be a thousand words or more. And you go, well, yeah, or short content doesn't rank well. And I, I feel like, well, depends on who your competitors are and what the, what the query is uh, in order for me to know that. So I need something to kind of give me the competitive landscape and give me some sense of it. How are you using, you know, how, do, how does that, inf the information from competitors is what was really interesting to me because it could kind of help me uh, see where I'm, I'm at. This is a competitive business. Like we have to do better than our co competitors. H how are you using that uh, to, to help give suggestions in this tool, I guess would be my question. You hit the nail right on the head. So um, things change keyword to keyword, niche to niche. And while there's definitely a baseline for how things work there, you know, this is probably where Google's machine learning has come in. And initially when the, when the, um, when the search engine started, they had to choose seed sites to say, these are the best, you know, so they manually curated probably tons and tons of sites to say, these are the best ones. And then each of those are going to be different for their niche. You know, one niche is going to have, you know, 3000 word articles. Another niche is going to have 1000 just by nature of this content, you know, and, it's not going to be good or bad. It's going to be, this is appropriate for this particular thing. So as then it grows and it learns and, it, and, and then they improve it, what you figure out is that there, while there might be some sort of baseline of what you, you should do, uh, things when you really want to get an edge or, or you're trying to rank, they do change for each keyword. Yeah. So what we identified was, well, where can we get that information from? Well, we can get it exactly from Google. These are the sites that Google likes. Now, a big push forward though, was that there are outliers. You know, there are times because it's not just on page SEO. It's not what you're doing. There is the combination of off page SEO and other signals. So there are sites that won't have done things as well on page and will still rank quite well. And that's that's very, very frustrating when you're like, I know my content is better than theirs and they're still not ranking me. And that could be for a number of reasons. That could be there's inertia, you know, time. They got there first right. and things that are in first last longer in first. It could be their backlink profile. It could be some other signals. And so there, there's other things. So what we realize is that we can identify outliers. We're like, you know what? This content is uh -huh. way too thin. Uh -huh. And so then we're not going to consider that in, in the, in the oh, recommendations. Or we can say like, this content is way too large. You know, it's Amazon. You know, an Amazon page is ranking for a lot of different reasons. And so we're going to discount that. But then we also realize that you can't do it page by page necessarily. There are a few that we'll throw out. But we'll also look at it signal by signal or factor by factor. So just because they've done some things that might be out of bounds, there might be still a few things on that page that are actually helping them. And we're going to consider that uh, within our analysis. And then the analysis we're going to spit out is edge analysis. It's not just doing more because there are times when you want to do more. There are times when you want to do the same and there are times we want to do less. And those are the recommendations that we're going to try to give. So you can get an edge on your competition when you're creating your pages or, or optimizing your pages. I love it. Well, very good. And then, you know, the, the last thing I, I'm uh, practically required at this point to ask every guest about chat GBT. I don't know uh, how long this will be going on, but uh, it is a requirement in my contract, I believe at this point. So I, on, on your personal website, on your social media, it, pretty much everywhere I, I see, I see the words white hat. You know, you're a white hat SEO. That's, that's uh, important. I am you. a white hat. People don't think that, Yeah. <laughs> you know, they think like, just cause you try to break it or test it, yeah. you must be black hat, but no, I mean, our clients are banks, you know, and yeah, insurance right. companies, <laughs> they can't right. burn down their, their domain. Right. You have Absolutely. to find effective techniques, you know, for the long term. And so I, I, I am, I am white hat. <laughs> for no, sure. and I, I think, I think this is where, this is one of the most interesting uh, cases for the white hat, black hat thing that was really popular when I first started in this, you know, chat GBT, Jasper, these AI content tools. Have you developed any sort of like rules, of, rules of the road? Uh, any, any uh, truth that, that you would say, this is, this is, this is fine. It's an application. You want to write a regex expression, chat GBT can do a really good job of that. Uh, if you want to write <laughs> lots of content, that might be gray hat or even black hat. Where do you draw the line in terms of a, is a, is a white hat SEO? on how to use these AI content, right? Chat GPT and Jasper in particular. I think it's important to understand what it is. And while it has the moniker AI, there's yeah. nothing AI about it. Uh, it's not creating anything. 
Right. It has no intelligence. It's a content spinner. Mm -hmm. It is the best content spinner I've ever seen in my entire life. Yeah. But it has to pull from some other information. And so in that sense, what I see this is just really, you know, spinner chief from 2012. It's a duplicate content issue where if, you know, 50 sites all go out and they ask it all the same question, they're going to get pretty much the same answer. They're all going to put it on their website <clears throat> and they're all going to probably get dinged by Google at some point for duplicate content. Right. So it's not that the AI did anything, you know, the AI content, it was just that this is duplicate content and there can only be so much of the same thing on the web before Google starts to ignore it. So that's, that's how I approach this. I think using AI is fantastic to jumpstart content, to give you a rough draft, to give you ideas, mm -hmm. which is tools that we've had since, you know, I've been, I've been doing SEO for 10 years it, that we've had these tools doing this the, the entire time. This one's just pretty slick mm -hmm. and probably takes less configuration than a lot of those other tools did. But at the end of the day, you need a human to, to put something in. You need a human to edit. You need, to, you need a voice. You need branding, all those kind of things. You need expertise. None of that's happening right now. And it could happen in the future because I'm sure these spinners will get more fun and fancy. But at the end of the day, there's, it's still just a spinner. And um, that's how I would approach all of that. I love it. Well, very good. The, yeah, we've talked a little bit about your agency, probably not enough. We've talked about uh, your SEO tool. The thing we haven't talked about so far is Internet Marketing Gold, which is a training program you started. Tell our audience about IMG and where they can go to learn more. Yeah, so it's internetmarketing.gold is the uh, domain, but um, my courses are in there. Uh, I've got my, uh, white hat, my, my white hat SEO course, <laughs> which I personally really like. <laughs> um, and then also I've got a whole course on on-page SEO, which probably has more information on on-page SEO than any human actually needs. But um, it's all in there. And then there, there's access to 40 other courses. Uh, plus actually from other um, course instructors and kind of covering the gamut of, of, of SEO. And then also um, we do tests on Google's algorithm. So I still post my tests there mm -hmm. and we do quarterly reviews. So I'll do two to three tests in a quarter. My tests are there and then other testers who are doing things. And those are a lot of fun. Um, it's kind of fun to see how people are thinking, what they're, what they're going after, what they're experimenting with. I think what, if you do the courses and you get a framework, you know, mm -hmm. and, you, and you learn your SEO and then you can then take something you learn in a test and then add that to the framework. Some people try to do it the other way. They want to like test and then framework. That's hard to do. Mm -hmm. It takes a lot of time, but I would go at it with like, go and learn SEO, get your framework for how you want to do things. And then when you see a test and you can then apply it to like an area in your framework that, that makes the most sense. Well, I love, I love your methodology. And before I let you go, it's minus two degrees in Chicago today. Uh, that's Fahrenheit. <laughs> Uh, what is the temperature outside where you are in lovely Shanghai? We are in a cold snap and it is, it's like a 73 ish, but it is the, um, the ties all have ski jackets on and they are ready. Like if it gets any colder, they're just going to walk out in the street and give up. Like they are, they're like, this is enough. <laughs> it's actually, un this is unusually cold right now. It's, I it's delightful. I'm, I'm in shorts and a, and a, and a short sleeve shirt and I'm loving it. I'd love, I'd love a 30. That'd be nice for me. So I, <laughs> um, well, awesome. Well, yeah. listen, Kyle, I've really enjoyed the conversation. I like how your brain works. I think you've got a really great approach and, um, you just, you do think differently than, than a lot of the SEOs I talk to on a frequent basis. If, if people want to learn more about you, uh, your agency, your tool, your, your training course, what's the best way to get in touch with you? What's your favorite social media? Those sorts of details. Uh, just go to kyleroof.com and uh, all my stuff is there. All right. Awesome. Well, I've enjoyed the chat. I'm going to give you a virtual cheers for now. Uh, hey. Enjoy life out there. I appreciate you coming out at 1030 at night, your your time. Uh, hope to I'm hope to, to hope to see you in person sometime where you live, not where I live. Uh, that'd be nice. So let's do this again. Sometime right. soon. Sounds good. Sounds good. Thanks. Thanks, Kyle.